Hi, Evan Montes of Call Throne here, and uh, wow, it's been a while. I haven't put anything up like in two months, and uh, I thought it was about time I do something. So I decided to throw together this quick video on a simple subject, I think, which can be a little bit complex to understand, so I wanted to touch on it. And it is about something I came across earlier this month. Um, probably heard about it. Miley Cyrus defends gay rights tattoo. Okay, so what happened was Miley Cyrus got this tattoo on her middle fingers, like this equal sign, which was referring to all love is equal, and uh, it's referring to homose homosexuality and homosexual marriage and how she's supporting this. So she got the tattoo, she took a picture, she put it on her Twitter account, and then uh, this huge debate ensued. And some of her fans started asking, well, you know, about her beliefs in God and, and how she was supporting something that was anti-biblical. To which she responded, where does it say in the Bible to judge others? Oh right, it doesn't. God is the only judge, honey. God is love. I, you know, I, I heard about this news and I thought it would be a good time to talk about judging in the Bible because there is so much misunderstanding about judging in the Bible. And I've seen this defense used so many times in the past where people who live in secular lifestyles and who profess to believe in God they use this all the time to say that nobody's allowed to judge them no matter what they're doing because God is the only one who can judge and God is love. This is not the first time somebody uses it. I mean, it's been used so many times by so many people, whether it's porn actors, Playboy bunnies, or Hollywood actors, or people living sinful lifestyles. They love using this argument. And the problem is, many times Christians themselves do not understand this fully. Well, what does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Don't you know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So the answer is yes. Of course we can judge. The Bible says we can judge. Can you imagine a world where nobody judges? It would be anarchy. It would be terrible. We are supposed to judge. But let's continue. In Matthew Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you measure, you shall be measured against you. Again, so now it's saying we can't judge. So, what's going on here? Okay, it seems like a contradiction, I'll admit it. Or could it be that we are not understanding the Bible correctly? So how can you say two different things on the same subject and not be contradicting yourself? Let's analyze this. So we have to ask the right questions to have the right answer. So what is the right question in this case? The right question would be, if the Bible is saying two different things on one subject, then how exactly is the Bible written? So that's a valid question, and maybe the best way to start with this question is, how is the Bible not written? So let's begin with this question to start understanding everything. How is the Bible not written? Well, it is not linear, but man is linear. So the question now is, what is linear? Thinking how to answer this with the best and clearest explanation, I can only come to one solution. I decided to let somebody who has experience with this topic explain it. And who better than Captain Sisko of Deep Space Nine? Take it away, Captain. What are you? My species is known as human. I come from a planet called Earth. Earth? This is what my planet looks like. You and I are very different species. It will take time for us to understand one another. What is this time? It can be argued that a human is ultimately the sum of his experiences. Experiences? What is this? Memories. Events from my past, like this one. Past? Things that happened before now. Linear time. What is this? My species lives in one point in time. And once we move beyond that point, it becomes the past. The future, all that is still to come, does not exist yet for us does not exist yet? That is the nature of linear existence. Thank you, Captain Sisko, and basically that's how we can define ourselves. We are 
linear beings. So basically, we look like this. We live on a timeline. There's a past, present, and future, and it's continuous. It goes in one direction. So we are linear beings, which in turn makes our lifestyles to be linear in nature, and which in turn makes our mentality and our relationships and just about everything we do has a linear nature to it. One example is our reading and writing methods are linear also. So when we're writing or reading, for example, a story, it's the same formula. It's we start at the beginning, at the very top, and we go left to right or right to left, depending on what culture you're from. And it's a straight line from one extreme to the next extreme. Then we go down, we start from the beginning, we continue to the other side in a straight little nice line, then we go down and that's that's our method of reading and that's our method of writing and it's just in a straight line the the entire story itself is a narrative that has a beginning a, a middle part a climax a development and finally it just culminates in an end the entire story is linear and that is basically how we write books or how we live our lives we are linear creatures we live on a linear existence but there's a problem with being linear. Once again, to explain this, Captain Sisko. Your linear nature is inherently destructive. You have no regard for the consequences of your acts. That's not true. We're aware that every choice we make has a consequence. But you claim you do not know what it will be. We don't. Aggressive. Adversarial. Competition. For fun. It's a game that Jake and I play on the holodeck. It's called baseball. Baseball? What is this? The rules aren't important. What's important is... It's linear. Every time I throw this ball, a hundred different things can happen in a game. He might swing and miss. He might hit it. The point is, you never know. So basically what he's saying is that as linear beings, we are totally clueless. We have no idea what's going to happen in the next five minutes, uh, much less in the next five years, much less in the next 50 or 500 years for, the, for that matter. We're clueless. But thankfully, we have God to the rescue. God is not linear. God is eternal. So what does that mean? Man looks like this, right? A timeline, straight not knowing what the future looks like, not knowing what's ahead of us. But God is different. God is not on a timeline. God is eternal. So God basically looks like this, like a circle. There's no beginning. There's no end. It's just eternal. It, it has always been and it always will be. It is nonstop. So think of man as a line that is subject to time. Think of God as a circle that is just eternal. The Bible even talks about this. The Bible tells us that the spiritual realm is nonlinear. Psalms 90 says, For a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Or 2 Peter, One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So right here the Bible is telling us that time in the spiritual dimension is radically different from what it is on our uh, physical dimension. This is extremely important because if God was linear, he would be totally clueless as to what's going to happen. And he would be totally clueless as to what to tell us to do and how to prepare. So thank God he is not linear. Thank God he is uh, non-linear. Thank God he sees the future and the past and the present at the same time. And that way he can tell us what's in the future. So as God is non-linear, so is his mentality. So is his lifestyle, so to say. His way of being is non-linear. And he basically says so in the next verse here in Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. So considering that the author of the Bible is a non-linear being, we have to understand that the Bible is a non-linear book. We cannot apply linear thinking or analyzing or studying when we are looking at the Bible. It doesn't work. It's non-compatible. Now the Lord is telling us in Isaiah 28, But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. Not continuous, not linear, but it is 
and bits and pieces around the Bible that we have to put together to bring these things together to be able to see the complete picture. So that's how the Bible is written. It's written in pieces that we have to put together. It's, um, it's a puzzle. Think about it. Jesus never said, read about the Lord, read about God. He always said, search. Search for the kingdom, search for God, search for answers. Not read about it, but search. So studying and analyzing the Bible requires searching for all these pieces. So it's up to us to find where all the pieces of one topic will be. So for example, if you have topic A, the entire topic is not going to be under one chapter or in one book necessarily. It's going to be in bits and pieces, here a little, there a little. And you have to bring all of those parts together. God basically says so, uh, 1 Corinthians. Now we have received the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches in that linear thinking or linear wisdom, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So when you're comparing things, you're putting them together side by side and you're looking at them. That's what we're supposed to be doing with, God, with the Word of God, putting together the correct things, comparing the spiritual things with the spiritual. Let's do an example. Let's take one topic. How about women's submission to man? Now this topic has been misinterpreted and distorted, sometimes in a way that it was so radically corrupt that some of the worst atrocities against women have been committed using this topic from the Bible. Even rape has been committed against women by forcing this topic onto them in a distorted fashion. Now does the Bible talk about submission of women to men? Yes, it does. But here's where it gets confusing. You will not comprehend what it means for a woman to be submissive to a man if you do not put all the pieces together and have the complete picture. Now the verses where we find uh, that a woman has to be submissive to a man is basically uh, these two. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the, the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God, 1 Corinthians. Or, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their husbands in everything. Now, man in his carnal understanding, or in his natural linear understanding, would see these verses and say, oh, okay, so I'm the man of the house, quote-unquote. I am the king of the castle and you have to do what I say and I rule the house and, and I have the divine right to do so. It says so in the Bible. However, if we start looking at this in a non-linear way because that's how the Bible is written and we start comparing the spiritual with the spiritual, we start putting all these pieces together, we're going to get the right understanding. Let's begin with analyzing 1 Corinthians. Let's look carefully. Let's just look carefully here. It says, what does it say? The head of the woman is the man. Okay, that's kind of obvious. but let's analyze the other parts. What does it say? It says the head of every man is Christ. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a hierarchy. So God is first, God is the head of man, man is subject to God, thus creating him to be the head of woman. That's how it works. However, many times this is what happens. Man is not subject unto God, or he is not listening to God, or he is ignoring God's word or God's mandates, and he just decided well, I'm not listening to God, but the woman has to obey me anyway. That's not how it works. If man is not listening to God, or if man is not following God in his will and his instructions, then he has no authority in turn. He loses whatever divine authority he had. So the formula of man being the head of woman falls apart. I mean, it, it says so right there in uh, Ephesians. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, as unto the Lord. So it's basically saying that women have to subject themselves to their husbands in the same way to the Lord. Why? Because in this format, if a man is obeying God and the woman is obeying man, then basically she's just following the commands of God through her man. So every time the Bible talks about husbands being the head of the wives, it's only referring to husbands who are submissive to God. That's it. I'll prove it. When God was creating man in Genesis 1, he created man and gave him authority over all the earth. Okay, that was man's divine right, his divine authority. But it, it only worked with the same formula. But we all know what happened, right? God, um, man rebelled against God. So what happened? Man lost dominion over the earth. That's how it happened. Man does not continue to have authority if he rebels against God. Satan stole man's authority. And we see that, you know, in the gospel. Satan is called the prince of this world. Why? Because he took the dominion of this world. 
And this is what he was offering Jesus when he was tempting Jesus. He was offering him all the kingdoms of the world. So the gospel is proving that man lost his authority because he rebelled against God. So in that same way, man has no authority over woman if he rebels against God. Okay, so we have that part understood. Let's continue. Let's look at in what way a man is supposed to be the authority in his marriage or in his household. Let's look for the pieces. For example, in Ephesians, if we continue on to verse 25, we're going to see this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So right here is the formula. In the same way Christ loved his church, we are supposed to love our wives. How did Christ love his church? Well, he loved it so much that he sacrificed his entire life for the church. This is the formula for men to govern their wives, their marriages, their households. Not as a dictatorship, not forcing women to do the will of the husband or the desire of the husband, but the exact contrary of the man sacrificing all his own personal desires, wants, and cravings by putting the marriage first, putting the family first. It's sacrifice. It's not dictatorship. And again, we are to look at the model that was given to us to follow. It is the way Christ loved the church. If we continue with Ephesians, so men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his, own, his wife loves himself. For no man hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord, the church. So we are to treat our wives as ourselves because in the eyes of the Lord, we are one with our wives. We are one flesh. And once again, here is the model we are to follow. The same way the Lord loved, nourished, and cherished his church, we are to do the same with our wives. So let's look for the pieces that show us how the Lord behaved and treated his church. We can see that, for example, in Matthew 8, where Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. He was so not focused on himself that he didn't even have where to lay down and relax. He was completely focused on the church and her well-being. We can also see in John 13 and Matthew 20, Jesus, the king of the universe, bowing down before his church to wash their feet, to clean them, to make them pure. This is the king of the universe, so loving and humble with his church that he literally would bow down to her and clean her feet. He even said he did not come here to be served, but to serve and to give his life for his church. And that is the model husbands are to follow when practicing authority over their wives. Incredible, isn't it? And finally, the Lord tells us, we are to live with our wives according to knowledge. The authority we practice has to be according to the knowledge in the Word of God, according to the model He has given us to follow. This is extremely important because the authority that God has given us is like fire. If you're not handling the fire correctly or with care, you're going to get burned. Your authority must give honor to the wife. Why? Because she is an heir of God. She is a daughter of God and you are going to respond to God himself as to how you treated his daughter. It's very delicate and it is very serious. So men, be knowledgeable, be wise, and exercise your authority with extreme care in the knowledge of the Word of God. Okay, so now let's return to our original topic. What first looked like it was a contradiction, now we can understand that it is incomplete. We have to look at these two verses by putting together the rest of the pieces and discovering the big picture behind it. This time we're going to apply God's method. So let's look for the other pieces. And the most important piece, the piece that will kind of bring these two together in a comprehensive manner is the following. It is John 7, 24, where it says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So that's the explanation of these two verses. In one verse you have a prohibition to judge, and in the other verse you have uh, permission to judge. And why? Because there's two types of judging. There's judging based on appearance, based on gossip, on murmuring, on rumors, etc. And there's judging based on righteousness, on absolute facts with absolute evidence. For example, let's put more pieces together. Leviticus 19, you shall judge your neighbor in righteousness. Deuteronomy 1, judge righteously between every man. So what exactly does it mean to judge righteously? Well, if we continue looking for the pieces, we will find 
that if you're going to accuse somebody, you have to have at least two witnesses, or even better, three witnesses, that will verify your claims, or your testimony, or your accusation, or your judgment, in order to establish a correct judgment. Obviously, this is talking about real witnesses, not false witnesses. So this basically is equivalent to saying you need evidence. It's not enough to have your own testimony alone. You need evidence to back it up. And if you don't have evidence, you do not have a righteous case for righteous judgment. And that was the situation for uh, the adulterous woman in John 8. Now, many people don't understand what was happening in this narrative. Many Christians think that Jesus came and he was doing away with judging. He was doing away with the law. And that is based on misunderstanding. But the true reason that Jesus saved this woman from being stoned to death was because of this. Lack of evidence. I'll explain. In the narrative, uh, they brought, the Pharisees and the scribes brought a woman who was found in adultery. And they were going to stone her, but in the end they didn't. Jesus saved her. And he asked her, Women, woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? Now remember, there has to be two or three witnesses in any court case. But what did, what did she respond? She said, No, Lord, no man has accused me. So Jesus, as judge, said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So think of it this way. Jesus is just hanging out, minding his own business, and suddenly the scribes and the Pharisees bring this woman to Jesus. They're going to stone her to death, and all of a sudden you have a court. You have the accused, which is the woman. You have the judge, which is Jesus. And you have the jury and the witnesses, which are all the scribes and Pharisees. But what's the difference between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees is that Jesus is a righteous man. And thus, he is a righteous judge. And what does the law say? Well, when there's a case of adultery, what does the law say? If we go back to Deuteronomy 22, 22, putting together the pieces. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. So Jesus was not abolishing anything. He was not abolishing the death penalty, but he was actually following the law. And the law says both the man and the woman have to be put to death. But what happened? There was no man. Something was very corrupt in the whole situation. Jesus knew it. The scribes and the Pharisees, they dragged this woman to Jesus. They're going to kill her, but where's the man? Why didn't they bring the man? Why didn't they drag him along? Why didn't they accuse him? Did they let him escape? Is this even a real accusation? Are they lying? What's going on here? The only thing that's going on is that the whole thing is corrupt from its very start. Whether or not this woman was adulterous, the fact that she was brought alone with no man made the entire situation corrupt and against the law. So that's why Jesus asked everybody who was going to stone her, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. He was not saying, He who is without sin in life, no, he was saying, he who is without sin in this situation, he who is acting righteously in this situation. And the fact is, nobody was acting righteously because it was corrupt from its very start for the reasons I have mentioned. So all the Pharisees and the scribes, they realized that, yeah, they were acting in a corrupt manner, their whole accusation was corrupt, and so they had no moral right or justification in condemning this woman. So that's why nobody gave testimony. She didn't have those two or three witnesses necessary to condemn her. So the whole case was dismissed. Again, it was lack of evidence. Jesus was not abolishing the death penalty, the law, or judging. And this is because Jesus only judged in righteousness. Here he's talking to the Pharisees and telling them, you judge after the flesh. In other words, you judge after appearances or your own personal opinions or your own personal feelings or what you think or what you heard or the reputation of the person, etc. And Jesus said, I judge no man. In other words, I judge no man in that way. Yet if I judge, my judgment is true. So he does not judge according to appearance. He does judge in righteousness. And that's what the Bible is teaching us to do. So we can see that we are allowed to judge in righteousness and only if we are not being a hypocrite in the situation, if we're not doing the same thing. We can only judge somebody if we're not doing the same thing they are doing. We can only judge if we ourselves are in righteousness and if we have the evidence to judge against somebody else. And remember, we're not judging uh, the person. It's not personal. We are judging the person's actions. So next time a person tells you, hey, you can't judge me because the Bible says you can't judge me, you tell the person, uh, actually, I can judge you, and I have the obligation to judge you on your corrupt action or deed. 
And remember, in righteousness, we are even allowed to judge angels, which are superior beings to us. So don't let anybody ever tell you you're not allowed to judge a pastor or a so-called prophet or an apostle in the church because they are anointed by God and you are not allowed to judge them. If they are acting corruptly, not only are you allowed to judge them, you are obligated to do so. So no man is above the law. Not even the angels are above the law. But remember, you have to be in righteousness and you have to have evidence. So that's how you read the Bible and that's how you obtain correct interpretation of the Bible. The Bible interprets itself. Do not let anybody ever take one verse, shove it in your face, and give you some personal interpretation on it, okay? The Bible will interpret itself for you if you search and you look for the pieces. So be careful with this because corrupt people love using the Bible for manipulating other people. It's very, very common, and it can be very dangerous for you. You can be suckered into one million situations. So the next time somebody throws a verse in your face and says, Ha, you see, the Bible says so right here that you can't do this or you have to do that, you tell that person, Thank you very much. I appreciate your desire to help me understand what the Bible says I can or can't do, but I will need some time to analyze what you're telling me. I need to pray to God and study his word and put together all the pieces so I can have correct understanding on this. And I will get back to you in three or four days with my conclusion on the matter. Don't make any fast decisions and don't let anybody convince you on the spot. Take your time with the word of God and make an effort to study and look for him. Otherwise, you're going to be at the mercy of man. Now, the more you know the Bible, the easier it will be to put together all the pieces on a particular topic. However, if you're not very familiar with the Bible, well, here's the cool thing about living in the 21st century, that our Bibles can be digital. You can download one from the internet like this one I have right here. It's free. I'll give you the link in the description. Download it, install it, and let's say you want to understand about one topic, like, for example, eating pork. Are we allowed to eat pork? So you can do a search on this topic. Uh, not on the topic per se, but you can do a search on a particular word that is pertinent to the topic. For example, eat. Uh, search and then down here you'll find all the verses that uh, talk about eat or eating or that kind of uh, you know that kind of topic so you can start putting pieces together here and just you know do a, a cross reference on, on all the verses that um, mention eating or perhaps you want to know about dancing. Maybe your pastor at your church said it's, it's a sin to dance. Well, you know, go ahead, do a search, type in dance, and start putting together all the bits and pieces and, you know, come to a conclusion. And, of course, pray. I mean, don't depend on your computer. Depend on God. Pray to him to show you and to illuminate you on a topic. So I hope this helps. I hope I didn't go too long and I hope I wasn't confusing. I hope I was clear and I hope this helps for whatever, you know, your situation might be in regards to uh, understanding the Bible or God. So thanks for watching. Have a good day and God bless.